Very good evening. Madam Prime Minister Morley, on the behalf of the Exeter Council of Barbados House, members, friends of Barbados House and Barbados, we welcome you here this evening and we hope that your stay will be pleasant as we await your message patiently. I see that the MC took a part of my message when I was going to introduce the executive. But nevertheless, I will do that because it's very important that we know who they are. So I'll ask them to stand again and I will introduce them as they hold their office. We have Veronica, first vice president. We have Antonia Seeley, second vice president. Council members are Louise and Eleanor Smith, Louise Headley. We have Gus Hollowworth, our secretary, past president, here this evening. Uh, two of our council members are missing. Andrew, he just is in the back. Andrew Harris, also a council member. Madam Prime Minister, let me give you just a little tip of a Barbados house and what we're all about. We are a very active group, mainly retirees, um, but we have been helping Barbados over the years. For the past year, we've been taking groups down to Barbados for crop over. We have been supporting the Arabara Scholarship Fund, which is in Ottawa. Over the past year, we have a bed project, which started by our secretary, Gus Hollowworth, and we now change that to the Gordon Cummings District Hospital Project, where we send now the funds to Barbados so that they can purchase the needs as they see fit. We, so, we thought that while we'd be setting the beds, it's very costly to ship, so we thought it was better to send the money to them and they would dispose of it, how they see fit. We also have been donating to charitable donations to organizations here over the year. Dominica Association and the Antigua Association for the Hurricane Funds. So we'll be doing lots of work here in Montreal and we'll continue to support the Barbados government as well as the mission. We have a very good relationship with the mission in Ottawa as well as the Tourist Authority Board. They have been giving us great support and we also depend on them for advice to travel to the island. Next year is our big year. We're going to be celebrating 50 years next year. And we started the planning and we're going to be looking for support from the mission as well as the tourist board. Uh, we'll be taking down groups next year for, the, for a part of our 50th anniversary. We have some big plans. Madam President, we thank you and we hope that your travel to the next destination will be safe as you leave this place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. I'll now turn to tell you about our Council General and uh, introduce him to say a few words. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't know why I was looking at him when I was talking to you. I got a cold. You got to put everything down, so I've got a cold. Okay, so, and, I, and then I picked up his thing. I don't have your bio. <coughs> so she'll tell you who she is. Because I talk to her only through intermail or on the telephone, and I've never said to her, where's your bio? She says, this is me? I say, okay, this is me too. I mean... <laughs> I we go from there. So, Sonia, here you are, my dear. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's really wonderful to see all of you here. Um, since I've been in the post, which has just been a few months, this is my first trip to Montreal. So I'm really very excited. 
and I'm just, like I said, it's really pleasant to see everybody and the colors are fantastic and you all look very wonderful. You're gonna be hearing a lot from me. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be hearing a lot from me in the future, so I won't take up any time now. This is another, this is for something else. This is more important now for the Prime Minister to address you. So I won't be taking up any time. But just to say, like I said, that I'm very happy to be here, very happy to meet some people for the first time and say hi to others for a second and third time. And I think now this means I need to come a lot more often so that you can get to see my face, right? And, um, uh, et si je visite uh, plus souvent, alors, alors je pratique mon français. Oui. Thank you. Ready to go? You can come back now. Oh yeah. If you can say that, you can come back. <laughs> I am now going to turn to our new High Commissioner, who is an extraordinarily nice man. Uh, an extra <laughs> I think we'll keep him. <laughs> and as you know, it's the Honorable Reginald Farley, JPCPA CMA. And Reginald Farley was born on the 26th of June, 1961 in Barbados. And as someone asked tonight, yes, he's married, so leave him alone. He's a Barbadian accountant and former cabinet minister. He holds a BSc in economics and management from the University of the West Indies Cavefield Campus Barbados. In 2013, he received his certificate management accountant in CMA, the designation from the Society of Management Accountants of Nova Scotia. Mr. Farley is a member of the following professional bodies. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados, the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada, Nova Scotia's chapter, and the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institution. He started his career as a teacher and part-time tutor at the Barbados Community College. He later moved to the Barbados Industrial Development Corporation as a business development officer, and then to the Barbados Chamber of Commerce as its executive director. And that time span was 1992 to 1994. He was appointed a government senator from 1994 to 1997, and later served as the member of parliament for, East, for Christ Church East from 1999 to 2008 with the Barbados Labour Party. He was a minister and held the portfolios of industry, commerce, and business development from 1994 to 1999, industry and international business from 1999 to 2001, economic development from 2001 to 2003, Education, Youth Affairs and Sports from 2003 to 2006, and Housing and Lands from 2006 to 2008, and now he's ours. He represented the government of Barbados on several international boards and, com and committees. Since 2009, he has held the position of Executive Director of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados. And as I told you before, Mr. Farley is married, <laughs> and he has two children. So back up. <laughs> Just before I ask Mr. Farley to speak, are you trying to get in? We have room. At the, you can, there's room. Do come in. We have some extra streets. Do come in. Please come right up to the front. No, keep coming. Keep coming. Don't be shy. Come on up. Take either seat you want. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll now turn it over to Mr. Farley. Mr. Farley, thank you very much, High Commissioner. Test in one, two, three. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your kind introduction. Today is not about me, it's about the Prime Minister and Minister Humphrey. Um, let me just say it is a pleasure to be here and I thank you all for coming. Uh, I know you had your choice of engagements for the evening and I'm very pleased that you chose to spend it with us. Um, we as a government, only 10 months old, we're very much committed to 
expanding and deepening our engagement with our diaspora. We believe that Barbadians who choose to live outside of Barbados are very much Bajan to the bone. Um, still have the cuckoo and flying fish and <laughs> some molly and some pudding and sauce. And I don't want to. I don't want to get you guys hungry. None of that is available this evening, though. <laughs> don't get your hopes up. But we believe that you need to be part of the conversation. You need to be part of what we are doing at home. And mercifully, unfortunately, technology allows that to happen. So that um, you'll see that part of what we'll be doing as we set up our mission at the Consulate and the High Commission, as well as directly for Barbados, is really reconnecting, engaging, ensuring that you have voice um, in our affairs, our future directions. As for me, being the, having the privilege of representing Barbados in Ottawa, um, with responsibility for Canadian matters generally, my responsibility is very simple. To enhance and protect Barbados's image and brand, with the support of Consul General, Director of the BTMI, Invest Barbados, Farm Liaison, Labour Programme, and so on, as well as protecting the interests of you, Barbados living overseas. So please, you know, call on us. We're here to represent you. We're like your MPs over here, um, Barbadian MPs over here. You know, if you're in Barbados, we've gone to your MP there. We are the government's representatives here. And uh, in addition to going to your MPs literally here, with, with respect to Barbadian interests, please feel free to call on the mission or the consulate if there are issues related to Barbados that, with which we can um, assist. And we also have responsibility of projecting Barbados' strategic interests internationally, and in my case, specifically in Canada. So I spend some time with the federal government and government officials and working with local authorities to ensure that Barbados' interests are known and can be taken into consideration in Canada making its own sober decisions. So let me thank all of you. I've, I've met some of you before. I look forward to meeting more of you. And I should tell you that I gave a very clear direction to the Barbados House Montreal that their invitations to me should not be limited to these high-level, fancy um, things where I speak. I, I was about to lead a protest, including <laughs> placards and having people behind me, because I only knew of your event last Saturday night on about Friday, when it came up in a by the way, in talking about this event. I'm a limer. Now for those non-Barbadians <laughs> present, a limer is a guy who needs no excuse to go hang out with friends, <laughs> have a drink and talk. <laughs> you know? yeah. So if you check your modern urban dictionary, you'll see limer as meaning that. So I'm a limer. So I'm happy. If there are three people gathered next to a tulip in the spring and you call me for a lime, I'm there. <laughs> if there are 3,000 in effect and you call me, I'm the first there and the last to leave. Whatever it may be, I don't have to speak, I don't have to be a friend, I don't have to be identified. I just want to hang with you guys, get to know all of you, and that is it. So from time to time, I will come and I will be very dignified, I would even wear a tie and I will give you a High Commissioner's type of speech. I can do that as well. But um, I really want to um, say that Sonia and I, we are very happy to be here in Canada representing Prime Minister and the Cabinet and the Government and the people of Barbados. And we look forward to working with the formal association, but with you individually, with you in the social media space, whatever your platform may be. We all can pull together. We all can work for the glory and honor of Barbados. Thank you very much. I believe I have another job to do, but the MC may tell me what my other job I have to introduce Absolutely. Minister Humphrey. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask you, sir, to introduce Minister Humphrey. Thank you very kindly. <laughs> it is really a pleasure for me. I feel as if I am introducing my political son. Even though I'm not old enough to perform that clear honor. <laughs> Kirk Humphrey, the Honorable Kirk Humphrey MP. And that MP really is a precious MP. Now, as Frank and other politicians here will know, there are very few politicians who can have the honor and claim the privilege of showing the kind of, as they would say in Spanish, the cojones. <laughs> to defeat a sitting Prime Minister. 
Dirk Hofi. Kurt Humphrey had the courage to run against the Senate Prime Minister, and Kurt Humphrey is Minister there because he won. And won convincingly. He won every box, I think, every box in that writing, as you will call it here. So that gives you a sense of his political pedigree. But I'm also pleased because Kurt Humphrey is emblematic of the nation of Barbados. And why do I say that? Barbados is a country, small as it is, where thankfully, through the work of our forefathers, your position at birth does not di dictate your destination, it, not even, even before death, but the destination at death. Amen. Kirk Humphrey, like many of us, you know, we, Kirk, can I share this, this situation? We were born in regular Barbadian villages, neighborhoods. We were the boy next door. We played, we laughed, we joked, we climbed trees, we pitched marbles, we played cricket and football, and we were unrecognizable from the next guy next door in school or wherever. However, we made use of the opportunity. So Kirk made use of opportunities presented, presented to him, particularly by way of education, and having that confidence in self, but that love for country, to not only advance himself, but use his skill, his knowledge, his talent, to work for Barbados. Let me tell you very quickly a little bit about Kirk. Kirk has a bachelor's in management from the University of the West Indies. He has a master's degree, master of science degree in social policy from the London School of Economics. And as if that was not enough for me, an eminent and distinguished school attended by no less a person than our prime minister. But he figured, well, let me not stop there. Me I went there, let me go a little further. He has a master of arts degree from Harvard University in public administration. <laughs> now that alone will probably make him well qualified, the best qualified to be a minister of government. But I think more importantly, he is empathetic and he is energetic. He understands the ordinary man's situation. He understands what it is like to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, seize opportunities. The old prince of Carpe Diem seize the day. And he sees every moment, every day, every year to be here today. Kirk is, has another honor. He is the first minister ever in Barbados, indeed in the Caribbean, and few in the world with the portfolio of blue economy. He has been thrown into, I, I almost would say the deep waters, but that would seem a little, <laughs> yes. No pun, <laughs> no pun intended. But he's been thrown into the deep waters of the blue economy. Oh, that ocean up there, what will we do with it? Protect it, exploit it for, in a positive way, for our sea bears. And in my former constituency, Christchurch East, I had a strong fishing community, so he now has to work for myself and that community, as well as other, uh, international collaboration. But he also has the portfolio of maritime affairs. Kirk, by way of other work experience, work with the Child Care Board in Barbados and other um, government entities, but he also was, he also was so good that the Canadian government hired him whilst he was in Barbados to work for the Canadian High Commission. He was so good, there was probably no Canadian available <laughs> to match his skills. So notwithstanding his age and his movie star um, attributes, <laughs> Kirk is a serious man, a man, a young man, who has determined that his energy, time, talent, in fact his time, talent and treasure will be put to use, not just for himself, but for the benefit of his fellow Barbadian. And today it is my pleasure to invite Kirk Humphrey, Member of Parliament, Minister of the Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy to address us. Wow. Wow. What do you say after an introduction like that? <laughs> when I went through a whole election and men were charged up and fired up and nobody did what the High Commissioner just did, so I want to thank him. <laughs> I feel a little overwhelmed now. 
uh, Prime Minister, distinguish everybody. I, I must tell you as, as, and can I say Reggie? As Reggie spoke, you know, I, I stood there, I came perhaps to say something else, but Reggie stirred a different emotion in me and permit me to share it with you this evening. Uh, I stood there and I sat there and I listened and my eyes were gazed on a young man in the back, Mr. Peter Mears, who is now, I think, the director of the BTMI for Canada in the Toronto office. And what Peter doesn't, what he doesn't know, what you definitely wouldn't know, is that when I was a student at the University of the West Indies, um, I lived in, in the Pine in Barbados, and those of you who are from Barbados would know, but it's, it's a lower socioeconomic area, challenged in many ways. And on some days, I would walk to the highway. And I would walk to the highway because I wouldn't have money to get to school. And it was my wise thought that somebody coming from Christchurch, going to St. James, would have to pass at the top there with the Polytechnic and they would give me a ride <laughs> so that I could get to school. And Peter Mears, many days, it is true, stopped and gave me a ride to the university and I'm thankful to Peter because I probably would not be here. <laughs> and and I, I think that, in essence, is the story of, of Barbados. You know, that I've heard people speak of all kinds of countries and people being able to rise above their circumstances, but that is the Barbadian story. And invariably many of us have been able to do things because we were privileged enough to be born in Barbados. And that there is no other country in the world, no disrespect to Canada, because they love Canada, <laughs> but there's no other country in the world like Barbados. And I, and I want to say a little bit to my time at the Canadian High Commission. Canada does really good work in the region. Most Barbadians don't know because there is a quiet kind of grace and dignity about the way Canadians do things. They're not very boastful people. But, but Canada has done excellent work throughout the Caribbean, both in terms of its social policy and both of, in terms of its contribution to public financial management its leadership in the blue economy, its work in relation to gender, fantastic work throughout the Caribbean, but in this kind of quiet, dignified way, and it's therefore natural for us to be partners uh, with a country as nice as Canada is. And as I came in, I saw the sign at the airport that says, we welcome everyone, which is a lesson for other countries to learn, hopefully other people who need countries to learn. And, um, I had a, a teacher while I was at school. I talk about her all the time. The Prime Minister knows well. Uh, she became the Chief Education Officer under the Prime Minister when she was Minister of Education. Who at the time when I was a student at the St. Michael's School felt that there was something inside me that perhaps could lend itself to my own development but to the development of, of other people. And she kept saying to me, you know, Kirk, you are greater than you think you are. And I never understood what she meant by it. You know, you're going to do good things in the world. And I thought she was just being kind. <laughs> but she saw something in me, and but she told me one time, she said, well, she addressed the class and she said, we must always understand who we are and where we came from. And that many of us who live in the Caribbean, we weren't brought there by choice. We were brought there by other means. But that we survived a very hard journey to get there. And then we survived hundreds of years of hardship while being there. And that those of us who now live are the sons and daughters of the strongest of the strong. And that no matter what we face, we must always remember our DNA is built strong. Your DNA is built strong. And, and I, I, in my darkest hours, I remember Miss Wendy Griffith Watson. I mean, she's still with us. God bless her. But I remember her because in her own way, she was saying, no matter what you face, you got this. So when the Prime Minister constantly says, don't worry Barbados, we got this. I feel as if I've heard it before. We got this. And why is that important for us to feel as if we have this? We both know, well not both, all of us know, that when we came to government, we did not have a simple task. 
We all know that in the last few years, things in Barbados were very, 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 very hard. And I, I, even though I'm a member of this great Barbados Labour Party, I am first and foremost a Barbadian. And that I would be empty of truth if I were to come here and say that Barbados was built by one political party. That all of us, the different parties, both the Democratic Labour Party and the Barbados Labour Party, did a lot of work to build the country up. And And so I'm thankful to all that went before me that have made a significant contribution in terms of helping us get to where we now are. But when we came into office, it was difficult. And we found a situation where, in many ways, Barbados almost became unrecognizable. We went from being one of the most, I mean, somebody used the phrase, punching the phrase, punching above our weight, to being punched, basically by people under our way. And I couldn't understand what was the main issue at the time. And I, I studied social policy, and I studied social policy for, in relation to poverty reduction and so on, so I could understand what kept poor people poor. And I, I mean, I've applied all kinds of concepts and so on, but then one thing occurred to me very, very strongly. That is not only about the theories and the policies and so on. You cannot separate any of these things from the fact that in the absence of great leadership, something could happen to your country. Something quite untoward, really, could happen to your country. And I feel as if Barbados is now blessed. In fact, I am sure Barbados is now blessed to have the Honorable Mia Motley leading this country and return us to leadership. It's been a difficult time for us. Barbados, you know, became the third most indebted country in the world. It is not a badge that one should wear with honor. We had one of the highest debt to GDP ratios in the world. We had certainly the highest in the Caribbean. We started experiencing levels of poverty in Barbados, in a modern Barbados that did not reflect a modern Barbados. One of the greatest tragedies, I think, in the last few years is that the one thing that has allowed me to stand here and most of us to stand here or sit here now is that all of us born into relatively stringent circumstances were able to use education to move us from one point on a ladder to another to another. And that we saw people denied the opportunity to go to university and advance themselves. And that, that has hurt me at the base of my Barbadian belly. Because the reality is that for most of us, we only got here through education. And that to get us out of where we were, still are, it would require a significant investment in education and in people. And I felt and clearly the Prime Minister felt that it was a very short-sighted approach to cut education from the people at a time when the people needed it most and at a time when the country needed it most. Because education was to take us into the future, and the future is now. And if you take education away, then we're condemning ourselves back to a past that none of us would want to go back to. And I felt that that was perhaps the one greatest sin committed against the people in Barbados in the last 10 years. And I am again very happy that the Honorable Prime Minister as one of the first acts of our government was to make education, university education, free for Barbadian children again. And it, it is important. It really is important. I feel that we have a lot to do in our country. I feel we now have to rebuild some of our institutions. We have to salvage what has become of our governance processes too. People have to have faith in who we are as a government. 
I remember in St. Lucia, just before the election, I popped out of the country. I probably shouldn't say admit this here to the, <laughs> to the Prime Minister, but I popped out of the country <laughs> for a few days with my daughter so that she would take pity on me now. To have a few days with my daughter and reborn, you know, because elections are hard. Okay. But when I was in St. Lucia, the guy who was driving the taxi recognized me. Accent. He said to me, you're from Barbados? I said, yes. And he asked me a question that people started asking very recently of Barbados. What has become of Barbados? What is wrong in Barbados? And even though I, 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 I really don't play politics, because for me, when I'm cut, my blood bleeds red, like your blood bleeds red. When the rain falls, it falls on everyone's rooftop. But something has happened in our country. And it was, it was a scary thought for many of us. You know, how do we get our country back on track? But I remember, as when Griffith Watson would always say to me, we are the strongest of the strong. And I would say during the election campaign that we are all threads in the fabric of humanity, intricately woven into the greatest tapestry that is life. That all of us together could make something better, for not only for ourselves, but for everybody else. And that we have to work together as a collective to be able to move from one state to another state. And that we must, we must work together regardless of politics or regardless of which side of the country you're from or which island you're from or if you are from even the US now or Canada. But that we must work as a collective unit to build Barbados back. And I want to implore you this evening to help us do what we are trying to do to make Barbados or allow Barbados to continue to be the great nation that Barbados is. And that a lot depends on our capacity now, not necessarily to be smart and to be bright, but our capacity to care. Because what is happening in Barbados is happening to all of you. When I think about Barbados, I was just saying to the Prime Minister, I understand there was a shooting in my constituency. Thankfully, the person didn't die. But whenever a young man takes up a gun and attempts to shoot another young man, to me, he's shooting at me, he's shooting at you, he's shooting at your children. That young man who is doing the shooting is my son, my brother. That none of us can expect to live in a country where all of us are doing well and forget those who are not. Because that's not how great countries are made. And that when our forefathers, when Errol Barra labored, and when Grantley Adams labored, it was not for some at the expense of the rest, because we never felt that some people were created more equal than others. And my heart hurts every time I hear that somebody has been shot, for both the person who does the shooting and the person who's been shot, for the family and I've just been to a funeral a few weeks ago for somebody who was killed. I grieve for the family, but the person who did the shooting was also my constituent. I grieve for the shooter and for his family too. Because all of us are just threads in the fabric of life. And we can come to Canada, and I am pretty sure we have in Montreal, we can tell the story of the wonderful things we're doing. And believe me, we're doing wonderful things as a government. I mean, I, I think about the last 10 months that we've had in office and the amount of work that we've done. I think about the nights that I do not get to sleep because the Prime Minister really, really insists on results. I've never been in cabinet before, but I have been told by the other senior members in the party that it is not a normal cabinet. <laughs> It's no longer business as usual. We set targets now. It's run like, you know, Canadians do result, results-based management. There's some results-based cabinet meetings. So the first item on the agenda are the transformative issues. Those are the things we came into politics saying these are the things we're going to fix. 
Unfortunately, there was a very long list of things. But every meeting, we have to report on the things we said we were going to fix. What's the issue with the South Coast? Have you been able to fix it? Yeah, we've been able to fix it. I don't know if you all know this, but we've been able to fix the South Coast sewage problem. Let us talk about our debt. Our debt, at the, I think it was 174% or something like that of GDP. It is now 120 something percent of GDP. We've been able to work in a few months in bringing significantly down our debt. Let's talk about that too. And we can talk also about the fact that we've been able to bring new trucks to the sanitation. We've been able to bring some new buses to the transport board. I mean, we've been doing tremendous transformation. The Prime Minister has infused all of us with the sense that we must close the circle of empowerment. She says the circle of enfranchisement. That our forefathers labored to make sure that, you know, all of us had an opportunity to go from one point to another. And that it is now on us to take it to the other step. And because they have the ministry responsible for maritime affairs, including fisheries, the Prime Minister says to me oftentimes, she says, what will be your legacy in relation to what you've done for the fisher folk? How are you going to say at the end of the day that you've been able to make life better for those people for whom I've given you charge? And for us, that means that we have to improve, we now have to improve the fishing, the fishing boats for many of the fisher, fisher folk. We have to make the conditions in the market more pleasant because the truth is many of our markets do not look very pleasant. And I should also tell you that in the next two, two, three months, you will see both Bridgetown and Oysins markets getting a complete facelift. <laughs> and Spike Stone as well. So we've done three. <laughs> because because at the end of the day, if you don't make life better for people, then what have you done? You know, it has to be about tangible results, but people must feel the effect of their government. And I, I therefore want to just say thanks to all of you. I have heard the work of, what was it called, the house? The Barbados House, Montreal. I want to thank you for your fantastic work. And I hope you continue to do it. And may the good Lord bless you for many, many, many years to continue to do it. Because Barbados is dependent on all of you in this room to go to that other level. I believe that we have a good thing going. I do. I believe that we have a very strong cabinet. I believe that we have a very strong, honest government. And if you've looked at the legislation we've passed, a lot of it in relation to public financial management, saying clearly to the world that we will not tolerate any kind of corruption at all because corruption has a cost. And you can see that we didn't come to office to play and that it cannot be business as usual. But I want to thank you for all that you have done for Barbados. The Prime Minister will probably speak of, of Vision 2020, but let me just say this very quickly, where we're going to be inviting all of you back home to Barbados or at different points in the, in the year. She'll speak to it, I'm sure. But I look forward to seeing all of you at some point back in Barbados and having a wonderful time. And when Reggie spoke about the lineman, what Reggie didn't say is that we used to jump together in the same Kaduma band. And, and, and so I, I don't mind seeing some of y'all in the Kaduma band, too. Or at least, at least at some of the facts. But this one, the Prime Minister would always say, is for Barbados. The glory of the last election is not for the Prime Minister, though. The truth is, I have never seen any one human being work as hard as Ms. Motley does at any point in time, anywhere in the world. And it's not for us either. It is really for the people of Barbados, those who currently occupy the land, those who used to occupy the land, those whose parents occupy the land, those who wish to do business with Barbados, and those with whom Barbados wish to do business, which is everybody. And Barbados now is open for, for business, and all of you are invited. Thank you all very much, and it's a pleasure to hear.
Thank you so very, very much, Minister. And I'm, I'm particularly happy that you mentioned the issue of corruption. Hey, Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister, <laughs> now, I'm particularly happy that you mentioned the issue of corruption because as honorary counsel, that's something I get asked a lot. Why should I invest in Barbados? Aren't you on the list? Aren't you one of the people uh, where corruption is rife and we're banking? And I'm always arguing with them and saying, no, we are not. And I explain to them about that double taxation. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to hear you mention that. Thank you very much because gives me something to go out there and fight some more with because there is that impression out there and that needs to be prime minister thank you again thank you so very very much for being here and i want to tell you that your people in barbados i mean in montreal we're working as hard as we can to make barbados proud of us and we love barbados we will always continue to love barbados and we love you and we want to thank you for everything you you've done i was very very concerned at the last election, a lot of us were very frightened, like, what is going to happen? When we saw the level of the debt, that was overwhelming. None of us knew what to do. And when you had to go to the IMF, that was one of the most frightening things that has ever happened. And then when I read how it's coming down, I, I just want to say thank you again. We will do whatever we can. I'm now going to call on the High Commissioner to introduce the Prime Minister. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. The Honorary Council, Dr. Lashley, has given you some facts on our Prime Minister. I want to share just a few perspectives. First of all, it is a great honor for me to have the opportunity to introduce the first female Prime Minister of Barbados. Also, the person who, in my judgment, and I've been around for a few mornings, will become one of, if not the most outstanding Prime Minister of Barbados. <laughs> I'm no longer officially in politics, so I can afford to make predictions. Politicians should never make predictions. I can. But that's my prediction. And why do I say that? Because it has been my honor and privilege to have known Mayor Amor Mortley, since the early 1990s. She ran as a candidate in 1991. She wasn't successful then. She was appointed to the Senate. She was still pursuing a very successful law career. And one day, she had just exited her father's, well, she was a partner, their law office on Colbury Street, nearby the Central Police Station. And I was passing, and I introduced myself. And I told her how outstanding I thought she was, and how far she would go, and that I was there to support. That's, we, that's how we went in the early 1990s. There you, there you go. And then in 1994, Wells canvassing in her constituency, which she joined St. George South. I was manager for Gwen Clark in St. George South, and Bourne's Village. You all know Bourne's Village? On the board, it's St. Michael, it's a St. Michael's, St. George kind of community near Locust Hall and between Locust Hall and Market Hill. And I spoke on a platform there in Bones Village for Mayor Amor Morley. But as if that was not enough, I want to say to you that Mayor has been a politician for so long that sometimes people forget and sometimes they have a way of pigeonholing us. If you're a politician, as Frank Alderas will know, people think of you as only that. You, you were born a politician and that is it. And sometimes they forget the, the skills, the talents, the experience that you bring from diverse aspects of life. Mayor Motley was one of the youngest, most successful advocates and attorneys at law in Barbados. She could have contented herself with serving her fellow man through the law and still have justified her existence on this earth. Because she took on high profile cases, not all of which she was paid. But if you had an injustice in Barbados, one that needed to go to the High Court, to the Privy Council, there was no Caribbean Court of Justice in those days, Maymot would take it on. 
And people forget that. An outstanding career, recognized by all as very intelligent, having a sharp wit, eloquence in language, but fire as far as fighting against injustice. And she used her knowledge of the law to be on the right side of many a social issue. People may forget that this exceptional young woman, this exceptional attorney at law, also had a sense for culture, culture in general, but things Barbadian in particular. You could not want someone who is more in love with Barbados. The simple things, the mahogany chairs made by our ancestors of hundreds of years ago, the fine Barbadian craftsmen, Barbadian art, Barbadian music. And I tell you this, that as a young woman, she was a manager of a band. <laughs> and the story is told, and you don't have to believe me, believe Nicholas Branker, Arturo Tapping, outstanding Barbadian musicians, but she had hoped to be one of the players, but because she couldn't play, <laughs> at an order to contribution, she was the manager of the band. <laughs> With those young men who went on to become world-class musicians. She managed Jagna, the John King, who is now a cabinet colleague. And she has been involved in many things, the arts, the law. Against that very background, and even though we are well in advance of other societies as far as women's rights and opportunities are concerned, the world is still not necessarily a woman-friendly place. And especially the world of politics. So for a young woman with a brilliant legal career, background in culture, interest in many things, to choose to expose herself to the vagaries and some may say the... the, the, the um, not violence in a physical sense, but in terms of the words, the language, the propaganda. It was because of her inherent love for people. She was raised in a background where part of your success could only, or you could only be considered successful if you were doing things for people. And that's the background from which she came. And I think that that is important because as Prime Minister, she didn't drop out of the sky. She didn't just want power. She was there as part of the solution. I have had the honor of serving with her in cabinet. We were both appointed to cabinet in 1994. And in addition to good hard work, we did some good liming too. <laughs> so she qualifies as a limer. <laughs> Unfortunately, her time in office now does not permit her to have the freedom to lime. So I do that on her behalf. And because the judge is, is, is saying I do it on her behalf too. In fact, she does not, con she does not, um, absor she does not consume spirited or fermented beverages. <laughs> so if we go to Lyme together, I usually have hers and mine. <laughs> just to help things out, you know. But I'm saying these things just to remind you that in addition to being one of the greatest political thinkers and strategists of our time, that you have a quintessential Barbadian, a wonderful human being, a loving, caring, and empathetic person. And I would even say this. She may not want me to say this, but I have the bike and she can't stop me now. <laughs> but as in the corporate world, women in politics and business, sometimes have to appear tougher than the male cup to parts in order to be taken seriously and in order to get the job done. <laughs> but I want to let you know that the Mayor Motley, who is not the MP or the Prime Minister, is a wonderful, caring, loving, sweet person. You couldn't want a better sister, godmother, friend. So that you need, do not take us, do not take that all of us is the little parts that you see, the cameo shots that you see from our public life. But our private life, our, our life's experience has a strong bearing on how we approach public life. And I give those perspectives to say to you 
that all of what has been done in the past 10 months was not achieved by sudden flight, but through the many years, Mayor Amar Motley was toiling through the night. I remember in our, in our time in cabinet, Mayor was the chairman of a committee to prepare Barbados's first ever national strategic plan to span the period 2005 to 2025, a 20-year long-term vision. What kind of Barbados would we want to have? And she involved the university, all sorts of people, everyday citizens. Because she always was looking ahead. So all that is being done now is not just about the here and now. Yes, there are the, um, the mission critical short-term issues. But Maya has a vision for Barbados. But what do you think is more important? And I'll close on this point. Maya recognizes, our Prime Minister recognizes, that Barbados is not hers. Barbados is yours. And that part of what she has been doing for the past several years, in government to 1994 to 2008, and even more so in opposition, 2008 to 2018, is moving with the people, moving among the people, rubbing shoulders, being seen here and there and everywhere, not as a prop, but to talk to people. That is the case with her diaspora perspective. She wants to hear from you. So I suspect she may not speak very long this evening because she will speak, fair enough. But what is equally important with her message is to get some questions and comments from the floor, to engage. Because at the end of the day, if we want to have a cohesive Barbados, which is mission focused on a vision that we are all agreed upon, then we all need to make an input into that vision. So she will give leadership, she will give guidance. But you will find that our Prime Minister will be engaged with Barbadians at home and abroad because she is Bajan to the bone and she believes that Bajans who are born there are Bajans by choice, Bajans who live in Barbados, Bajans who live anywhere in the world must have a voice as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Barbados says Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amar Motley, QC MP, to address you. Thank you very much, please. Thank you. Kirk said it best, distinguished everyone. I feel humbled and it's a very touching moment to be here in Montreal this evening. You know, yesterday we had a very long trip here and as we thought we were about to leave, regrettably, the Air Canada flight landed and a gentleman who was 94 years old had a heart attack on the plane just before the plane landed in Barbados and he passed away regrettably and as a result the flight got cancelled and we had to take a flight into Toronto and the poor Consul General was pulled out of her bed and she met us there about one o'clock this morning and we got to the hotel about four this morning. But in all that transpired in the last 24 hours, it reminded me truly that life is not a straight road. And I couldn't help but think of the wife of that gentleman who's 84 and who thought she was coming to Barbados for a wonderful two weeks with her husband and what transpired. And in a very real sense, it then got me into thinking about the journey that our own nation has taken. That for the most part, many of you know and knew a Barbados that was fully and completely on an upward trajectory. And of course, over the course of the last few years, that upward trajectory became very confused. 
and became a different journey. And more than ever, in understanding and appreciating where we had gone to and where we need to go, I understood that Barbados is not going to make it in this world again with just Barbadians living in Barbados. And that what we needed to do was to build a movement. That it was not my responsibility simply to lead a political party because no political party can turn around Barbados in any 5, 10, 20 years based on where we had gone. And no resident population of Barbados alone will turn Barbados around. And you will therefore better understand why I'm here this evening. And this is going to be a journey of the diaspora this week in addition to all of the financial sector meetings and the IMF and World Bank meetings that we have over the course of the next nine days. And I speak to you in Montreal tonight. I speak to your brothers and sisters in Toronto tomorrow. And I speak to your brothers and sisters in Washington, D.C. on Saturday. Because it is time for all to appreciate that your country doesn't simply want you, but your country needs you. And we need you because, as Kirk said, our DNA is one that is labeled strong and resilient. And when we were young, we were taught a few simple things that I keep repeating because sometimes the simplicity is what we need most to communicate messages. We were taught many hands make light work. And we were taught do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the simple things that we were taught are in fact the things that we need the most. And that the country to which or from which you have come and to which I shall return shortly is one that is accustomed to being a leader and doesn't take kindly to people asking the question well, what happened to Barbados, as you heard Kirk relate, and what so many had said over the course of the last few years. And it is a country that recognizes that to whom much is given, much is expected. And we have been lucky, in spite of it all, that we could take the virtues of education and fairness because more than anything else, those are the two things that represent Barbados and Barbadians. Bajans believe in being fair. Bajans believe in social justice. And you hear people say all the time, I can't do that, I can't fear them so. You understand? <laughs> we fight for the underdog. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps if people understood that, they'd better understand why more often than not, Bajans stand on principle. Yeah. I hear people say all the time, that is my principle. Yeah. Or I stand in on principle. Yeah. How often do you hear it in normal conversation, far less in the affairs of nations across the world? Well, that's where we stand. Errol Barrow said it best when he said, friends of all satellites of none. Yep. That's what he was saying. Similarly, we are a country that believes that we have to be the best that we can be. Yes. And we become the best that we can be by doing and marrying two things. Marrying education and information, which is power, but marrying that also with that fairness to which I just spoke, which requires caring, because if you don't care, you don't have any desire to be fair. The two are hand in hand. And in a very real sense, where therefore the country went was a reminder 
that if we are going to do those things to lead again, then we have a lot of work to do in a short period of time. And that mission could only happen if we all decide to work together with a common purpose and in a common space. And I've come therefore to Montreal this evening to start the process of asking you to be active citizens of Barbados. Asking you to build out your country and to live out active citizenship. This is not for Canadians to get worried because we believe in dual citizenship in Barbados. <laughs> But we live in a world that is highly interdependent. And citizenship is essentially about locating yourself in that space, working out what you can do to help build out your country, and where you also benefit from being in that space with respect to your country. In 2007, in addressing the Barbados Canada Ball, in Toronto. For the first time I used a phrase that I have come to use almost every year religiously in dealing with the diaspora. That you can be a Barbadian by birth, by descent, by marriage, or by choice. Very often the most passionate are the ones by choice. The ones by marriage, their passion varies depending on the love <laughs> And the ones by descent are the most nostalgic. Because more often than not, it is the stories told by parents to their children, as you, I'm sure, have done to your children who might have been born in this country. Telling them about how things used to be. Telling them about what your grandparents and your parents taught you. Those stories come down. And we instill them in our children to make them understand that they come from a great lineage. That they come from a proud people. And those stories aren't lost. And you can see it when you see people like Eric Holder. The first African American Attorney General of the United States of America. Born of Barbadian parents. Very much Barbadian in his demeanor and in his outlook. And I can go on and on and talk about many others throughout North America. But that ability to pass on to your children the sense that they come from somewhere. Yep. How many times have you heard Bajan say that? Yeah. That you come from somewhere. <laughs> Don't let nobody fool you. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> and these are the things that create the passion in building out the collective leadership that is required of us now in order to be able to build our country. And why is the Barbados journey so important? We live in a world today where more than ever values matter. We live in a world today where the ability to influence for good matters more than ever. A hundred years ago, the world found itself tumbling between two world wars on the eve of one of the worst stock exchange crashes that was to come at the end of the 1920s, fighting for direction and fighting to be able to make a better life for the people of that time. All of us assumed that we were on an upward trajectory and that things would always be better than they were for our parents and our grandparents. Not true? All of us. But we find ourselves today perplexed and bewildered. Not sure exactly where the world has taken us. And if there was ever a time for a strong people with a strong vision and with the freedom to make decisions based on what they believe in, it is now. Yeah. 
But fundamentally, to be truly free, you have to be able to make choices. And you have to be able to determine your destiny. And that is why if Barbados is to be the Barbados that we must be for our children, and if Barbados is to be the Barbados that we must be for the Caribbean, and if Barbados is to be the Barbados that we must be for the world in which we live that is so unsettled, then we must anchor our people and to give them the freedom of choice that comes from economic stability and economic security. Our country must grow. And that is why I started by telling you that the journey never happens in a straight line. Because in our own way, we now value the growth that we need more than ever. Because we had reached a point, in the words of Galbraith, where a culture of contentment had set in. And people were taken for granted the things and the journeys that people took in order to bring the country and to bring our people to where they brought it. And things happen in life to remind us that you can't take things for granted. And that we have a responsibility to keep building. Nobody who has a house that doesn't maintain it can expect that the house will stand. You have to maintain it. You have to maintain your body. Things left to atrophy. Gone. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, at least you're monitoring what is being watched at home. <laughs> but the bottom line is that we have a responsibility to build back better that which was attacked. But in building back better the Barbados and building the best Barbados together, this time round, it cannot be only about the 300,000 odd people on 166 square miles. It cannot even be about the 166 square miles. The reason why Kirk is Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy is because our maritime space, our ocean, our waters are 400 times the size of what our land space is. And we live in a world that values what the ocean can do for us and we have a duty to take care of it. There are many of you who might have grown up near the beach at home or went to the beach often and would have seen sea eggs and cobblers and when you step on a cobbler you go for the soft candle to take the cobblers out. <laughs> Regrettably, there are young Barbadians who never have had that experience because there ain't no more cobblers. So that when we say that we're not only building out the 166 square miles, but we have to take care of the oceans around us, it's for all kinds of reasons, and a lot of that is interrelated with climate change and the other things that are confronting the world, because whether we like it or not, the Caribbean may not be contributing to the worst aspects of climate change, but we are on the front line of the war facing the worst consequences of it. But not only can we rely, therefore, on the land space, but go to the ocean, we can rely on the population alone. And I keep making the point that the real secret of the region that has now been understood is that the region, particularly the English-speaking Caribbean, is in fact underpopulated. Now I can talk to you in calendar about this story. Because if there is one country in the entire global community that has understood how to manage migration and how to move itself in order to be able to better exploit the territorial area that you have, and to be able to reach up and to lift to play your role in the global community through building a platform where all of like-minded values come together, it is in this country. And, and, and I can find no better place 
to start this discussion because it's not only about managing the migration, but it is understanding how you manage migration with respect for diversity that came out of the 1960s in the discussion here in Canada more than any other place today that stands as that example for us. So when I say to you that I feel humbled to be here in Montreal, I feel as though it's almost what was meant to be. Because when you look at Barbados's population size of 280,000 to be precise, on 166 square miles, 430 square kilometers, and then you look at Singapore, 670 square kilometers. And of that 670, almost a quarter, a fifth, a quarter of Singapore's land space has been reclaimed in the last few decades. So it's virtually just marginally bigger than Barbados. But more importantly, when you look at the numbers, 15 times the population of Barbados. Now, many hands do what? If we don't create the framework, the platform, for many hands to make light work, the growth that will give us that economic independence and security to make the choices that we want to make, to make and provide the type of leadership that we want to give, will not be there. And while there are some who advocated I suppose more pleasurable ways of expanding the population, we just don't have the time. <laughs> we simply don't have it. And that is why, for many, the single market and single economy of the CARICOM, Caribbean community is so important because that is one of the economic measures used by us, like in Europe, to be able to offset the limited size of population and the limited size of market that we have in the Caribbean. But even that is not enough. And technology now affords us opportunities that hitherto did not exist before. Technology allows us to be able to move and to relate to you as citizens in a way that we couldn't do 15, 20 years ago. That Sonia could play just now. The stream going back to people in Penny Hole and River Bay. <laughs> and the Orleans. And Lower Carlton. And Bush Hall. It's amazing. And the only thing I can't do to them tonight is to hug them physically. I can blow a kiss at them. I can talk with them. Just as when I go home, I can talk with you. And I can ask you to help in the building out of your country. Not just you yourselves, but your children and your grandchildren, even if born here. Because we are Bajans, by what as well? By choice and by descent too. And if we can do that, the critical numbers that we need to manage in order to be able to expand the platform base to create the growth opportunities that we need are all of a sudden there. But it requires decisions by us and it requires decisions and commitment by you as well. Some of you over the years, decades, have wonderfully been given charitably to things back home. Correct? But we need to do it in a more structured and purposeful way now to make sure that what we give is not overlapping with what somebody else is given from Connecticut or what somebody is given in Barbados and then there is redundancy in one place and large gaps in another. We can do that by using and managing the platform through the third sector. And to that extent, I appointed in my ministry a number of key names in different ministries to be able to send the signal of the type of Barbados that I want to build. You know that Kirk is Minister of 
maritime affairs and the blue economy, and I told you for the first time we will not rely on 166 square miles, but on our maritime jurisdiction. But I have a Minister of Labor and the third sector, because it isn't only about labor, it's also about the voluntary sector, the third sector, the charitable sector, the NGOs, the other people who come together to add value. And while some view the third sector as only charitable and NGOs, I also view it as those people in families and elsewhere who lift up their hands to add value in whatever way every day, whether it is taking care of elderly people that nobody's paying them for, or taking care of children that nobody's paying them for, because that adds serious economic value and helps us to stabilize the people who we have to take care of in the country. Similarly, we have a Ministry of Environment and National Beautification because we feel that Barbados must be beautified. It's not just about preserving the environment. And in beautifying it, it's also sending a signal and a message. People feel that large green spaces belong to metropolitan countries, parks, botanical gardens. We say no. It is time for us to be able to allow Barbadians to express themselves and to have that within our own context. But countries that are developing countries can't easily afford these things. But we can create a platform where many hands can make light work by all of us contributing to the building out and through skills or through investment in uncharitable donations to being able to have these things in our country. And hence, the National Botanical Gardens, by the time people come home for the gathering next year, we hope to be able to be in a stage not finished, but where you can see the possibility such that you too want to contribute to its further expansion and building out so that we can have one of the most beautiful botanical gardens anywhere in the Caribbean when we are finished. Similarly, we have a Ministry of Health and Wellness because if we don't start focusing on wellness, we can't afford to pay for health care. Simple as that. Equally, we have a Ministry of Culture, Sports, and the Creative Economy. Why? You know what our boy Patrick Husbands is to you here in Canada, in the horse racing industry. One of the best jockeys anywhere in the Americas, in the world. And he has made Canada his other home. And we know that artists and sportsmen are global citizens. Nobody asks them where they're coming from when you're at the top of the game. You think anybody can ask Rihanna where she's going to? <laughs> <laughs> they want her. You think anybody in the world would have stopped Sir so Sobers from living in the country? They would want him. And the example is that artists and sportsmen are global citizens. And if we can do more to be able to double down, and to train our young people to allow the talents which they have been imbued with to naturally flow, then we can spread the word of Barbados across the entire world with the values and the premium. <laughs> so that I say a few of these things to be able to show you that in the engagement of active citizenship, there is so much that you can do. It's not just about the charitable donations, and you can structure it to do that better with the technology. But it's also about the skills that you have. Many of you have come to this country and built wonderful careers. Have a level of knowledge and capacity that can add serious value to our country. Sometimes it's not always in the way that you think it ought to be. But by talking with each other, by us talking to each other, we can find how best to be able to use the repository of skills that you have to help us build out our country in the most effective and productive ways. And for you, it may represent economic opportunities as well. And for us, it may, recommend, it may re recognize, allows us to recognize that we too can add value using our own people and using you as an example to many of our young people as to what is possible if people stay focused, build a career, and can come back and add value to the land in which they were born. But in addition to that, in my budget speech of three weeks ago, I created a new opportunity, and that is investment. Because for the first time ever since the establishment of a central bank, 
Barbadians will be allowed to own foreign exchange accounts, hold foreign exchange accounts in Barbados, to allow you, therefore, to open accounts at home in foreign currency to help your country. And at the core of part of the problem that we had as a nation when we took over 10 months ago, was that we took over a country whose reserves were down to 400 million. Within less than one week of winning the government, and ironically, the first time that I spoke to Madame Lagarde, she was in Canada at the G20 meetings. And I remember speaking to her on the night of the 31st of May at about 7 p.m. the night. She was here in Canada. I was in Barbados at about 7 p.m. after cabinet. And I remember telling her that we were intending to announce the suspension of international debt payments the next day, the restructuring of our debt, and approaching the International Monetary Fund, not because we wanted to, obviously, but because we had to, and because the only way we could stem 23 credit downgrades by the international financial institutions or turn around the perilous situation of $400 million in foreign reserves was by beginning to do radical restructuring um, with respect to our reserves and our debt in order to be able to create a platform for confidence in our country again. Mercifully, I did say to her that you can't go on a long journey without giving people a little breakfast. <laughs> and it is that approach that has allowed us to carry as many people with us and to minimize the level of suffering that would otherwise obtain in a situation such as this, so that we were able to carry up the, the pensioners, non-contributory pensioners from $145 every two weeks to $225. We were able to resume. And by extension also, we carried up NIS pensioners. We were able to resume the payment of fees the tertiary level because the numbers at the University of the West Indies had dropped from 7,000 to just over 4,000. We were able to, to, sorry? We were able to give a 5% increase to public servants who had not had a pay increase since 2010. And it was the first pay increase that they had had um, in, in the country. And I can go on, we were able to create something called trust loans which is a way of being able to give ordinary Bajans who could not go to the bank or the credit union and borrow anything at all to be able to give you that first start of up to $5,000. And if you pay it back, you can borrow again up to $10,000 because for the first time, a government was taking $10 million out of government's budget a year and saying, we are going to take a chance on our people. We take a chance. We take a chance every year on people that we don't even know who come and ask for tax concessions. <laughs> and that is a foregoing of revenue. And if I can take a chance on people I don't know, I must be able to take a chance on people whose navel string bury right here. Amen. So that we did these things conscious that we were easing the burden of people who had been suffering, recognizing that we weren't promising them a rose garden overnight. That we're on a journey. And the journey going to take time. And the journey going to take some hard decisions. But in doing it, that we know we're going to get better. You can't get to the point of feeling better without going through the operation. But before you could operate, you had to stop the bleeding. And that was stopping the bleeding by being able to go in with the debt restructuring and with the IMF program. Today, as I stand before you, our reserves are now at 1.1 billion from 400 million dollars. And while the combination, yes, is borrowed funds plus persons bringing it in, both require the currency of confidence. And if confidence had existed before, they would never have dropped down to 400 million dollars. So that the currency of confidence is what we are rebuilding this country on. But confidence and currency are not alone sufficient without people to add production and value and 
those things that are necessary to constitute growth. And as much as I want to believe that it can happen from 300,000 people alone, I know that it also requires the 600,000 or so Barbadians who live outside of Barbados, by birth, by marriage, by descent, by choice. So that instead of 300,000 going to work to live every day, let a million come to work to live every day. And I say to you, therefore, that that is where I ask you to start the journey with us on active citizenship. As I said, being in Montreal makes this message even more poignant because part and parcel of what transpired in the past with the single market and single economy at home when we started the journey there or when we started to open up was the beginnings of xenophobia and people saying, oh, we don't want nobody to come in from outside, etc., etc., etc. And here in Quebec, you have learned how to walk with Canada on the journey of diversity to be able to build the wonderful economic platform that you have built for us. I can think of no stronger nor better example. Similarly, Canada's virtue in terms of being a place where people across the world can find sanctuary, especially in today's world, when people are told don't come, or when people are just simply baldly put out, is one that we have to find comfort in. We believe that our values are central to the Barbados that we will continue to build, and they must be, and we will stick fast to those values. But we also recognize that we can't do it with a limited base. I can't lift this easily alone. Top might come off as it did just now. <laughs> but if I try to lift the whole thing, I need two or three or four people to lift it. And then you look and turn to me and say, what else you want lifted? <laughs> because the task then becomes so easy and so capable of being done that you don't even think twice of it. I want you to help us on this journey. And whatever else you may have had in your mind and wherever else you may have come from on this part of the journey, I want you when you leave here to pause and think, to work with your Barbados House, Montreal House, to work with the High Commissioner, to work with the Honorary Consul, to work with the Consul General, to work with your family at home, to begin to say, how can I play my part? And it's not by accident that we chose 2020 to be the year where we ask you to come home to help us perfect our finest vision as a people. Because 2020 is about perfect vision. And it's not by accident that we have the wonderful conspiracy that we have 12 months in the year, 11 parishes and a nation. And for each month, there will be a parish. And for the 12th month, there will be the nation. So that for those of you who are from St. Lucie, by show of hand, let me see you, if any. There are no St. Lucie people in Montreal? <laughs> Only two people? <laughs> Peter Phillips will have to do something about that. <laughs> but January is the year, is the month when it all starts. And it starts in January in St. Lucie where we gathering gets off to the fine start to be able to bring Barbadians back home from wherever they are on this earth and to help us perfect that fine vision. And as you come home, whether it is with your old primary school or your secondary school or your church or your family's homecoming or the shops in the community or opening the bank accounts that you can now open and keep your money in, <laughs> whatever it is, the point is that that is one of two trips that you are going to make to Barbados next year. Because your first trip is for your parish and your second trip is for the nation on the 30th of November to the 31st of December when we come to the nation. We go from St. Lucie in January and in January we will also celebrate the centenary of Errol Barrow's birth. Because don't get tied up. There ain't no political party that will stop us from celebrating excellence in this country called Barbados.
and January next year represents the centenary of his birth. Similarly, in February, we go to St. Peter and we go right down March St. Thomas and we come right down to October in Christchurch and St. Michael in November. I, I see people run, running to put up their hands now. Who are here for Christchurch? Oh, Lord. Now I see why you wanted Reggie Farley as your High Commissioner as a former Christchurch MP. But you know, I have to ask you who are here from St. Michael. Boy, this is the first time St. Michael barely edged out Christchurch. <laughs> Reggie, I don't understand, boy. <laughs> For those of you who are Canadian, St. Michael probably has a population that is four times, three to four times that of Christchurch. So when in this room it can almost be half and half, I know that this is a Christchurch crowd. <laughs> But from the 30th of November, which is the date of our national independence, we forget about parishes. And we gather in 2020 becomes about Barbados. From the 30th of November to the 31st of December, we could not have asked for a better opportunity to be able to pull a people together, to be able to set us on the journey to activate your citizenship to help us rebuild our country, to help stabilize our economic security, and to create the opportunity, as Kirk said, for us to punch above our weight and not to be punched by those below our weight. <laughs> and I ask you, therefore, tonight, join us on this journey. Let us make our country that country that will continue to stand for right, continue to do right, and continue to treat its people in the way in which we know why because we have come through the hornpipe. Today represents, since 213 years, since Bussa stood at Bailey's plantation in defense of the rights of our people. And we don't often celebrate these things because it's painful. But let us not forget that if men like Bussa and Washington um, didn't stand up and Nanny Grigg and all of them, that we would not have the kind of society that we have. We would not be caring about the kinds of things that we care about. And all of us know that the modern Barbados was built on the tribulations of the 1937 riots, which led to the formation of the Barbados Labour Party and the Barbados Workers Union. But we didn't get there in the 1930s just so either. And that is why the celebration of all that transpired coming right through is still so important, not just for us, but for these young, younger persons in the audience who need to know, as I said, that they come from a strong people, a proud people, but above all else, a people who understood that if we allow those who come after to keep carrying the baton, that we will continue to have that kind of influence in the world that will cause always people to recognize that the country may be small, but the people are mighty. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Yes. Um, there's a guest book circulating. I don't know if you, where is it now? Okay, so has it, has it been signed? All right. So, okay, so if you've signed it, if it's down there, move it forward. Sign it and move it forward so that everyone has the opportunity to sign it. And if you have an email, please put your email address in it so that we can contact you. We know how to reach out to you, keep you informed of what's going on in the community, and also tell you how to send money. And don't forget, yes, and don't forget that there'll be a chance to win the basket at the end. But you've got to sign the book and send it wrong because we have to choose somebody randomly from that. 
The Prime Minister has had to leave the stage for a few minutes. She will be back. So in the meantime, I'm going to tell you what it means to me to be a Barbadian. And what it means to me to be a Barbadian, not only as the Prime Minister said, it's where my navel string is buried, and it's the home of my birth, but there's pride there. I'm always proud when I can say to someone, I am a Bajan, I am a Barbadian. And don't mess with me, and do not mess with any Barbadians, because we know how to hold our pride. We know where we come from. And we're not ashamed of where we come from. We're very proud of where we come from. I come from the same stock as of just about everybody else in this room. I was born in My Lord's Hill, which if you know My Lord's Hill, it's not a pretty, pretty place, as we would say in Barbados. It's not where the wealthy lived. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of wealth of ideas, a lot of wealth of caring. People made sure that we went to school. My grandparents raised pigs, and those pigs paid for my uniforms. They paid for my shoes. They paid for me, and her, grand, her grandfather, Ernest Motley, <laughs> you know, I remember my grandmother going down to see Ernest Motley when I was a child because she needed something. And she went to see him. And he helped us. And I can tell you, I'm not ashamed to tell you, at one point, the shoes I wore to school, he bought. And that's a good thing because that's who we are. And as, we, as, a, and as I grew up, as I grew up, the village looked after us. You know, you could go to the neighbor next door. Do you all remember meetings? Remember susus and meetings? Excuse me, I have to blow my nose. The call don't care where the hell you're living. Um, anyway, but I remember my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my, my mother, they all had susus. And I didn't understand what a susu was. But they had these meetings. Meeting is the same thing as a susu, for those of you who don't know what a susu is. And anyway, and I remember my mother saying to me, you will get this on this day, because that's when my meeting comes due. And I remember people coming to the house and saying to my mom, oh, you don't need it right now. Myrna has everything she needs. Errol has anything. Could we switch out with you? So that we'll get it on this day, exactly. So that you, you know, and I'll make sure that you get yours next week if you would let, let me. It was kind of like a, a, a loan that people did among themselves. They didn't go to the bank. You know the, the, the micro loans that you see in Africa? It was very much like that. And everybody paid so much into it every week. And then at a particular time, you got it. And then... I got into high school and I thought, well, this Susu thing works. So I started one in high school. And I said to my mom, I don't think you need to pay for anything for me anymore because I figured out this meeting business. And I remember getting my mom to teach me how to do the books. And she taught me really well how to keep books. That has stayed with me all through my life. I know how to keep books. And I know where to find the missing sense. To the extent that I had a, um, a grant from the government a few years ago and I was, every, you have to do quarterly to tell the government what you've done with the money when you're doing research and you have to send in the stuff. And I was going through it and I didn't check it carefully. We'll never do that again. I didn't check it carefully and I had someone else, somebody I'd heard sending it in to me, for me. The government came back and said, you're five cents over in their favor. And they said, find the five cents. This is not balancing. And I had, no, 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 it was a good thing. Taught me a lesson. Do not go away from what you've been taught because they taught us well. And I, that should never have happened. But I went through it and I found that five cents and I said thanks to my mom. I remember my, I, some of you have heard me say this before. My great-grandmother was a hawker, and she sold mangoes and bananas and all kinds of stuff. 
And they called her all night. And the reason they called her all night is because my grandmother, my great grandmother was determined that I would never be left alone at night. And so my mom worked during the day, my grandmother stayed there. And then when I was asleep, my grandmother went out to sell after I'd gone to, gone to sleep. So that's why she was called all night. So what the prime minister is telling you is the truth. This is who we are. And she's right. We tell our children, don't let anybody tell you you don't belong. Don't let anybody tell you you don't know who you are because we know who we are. And I'm going to turn over the mic very shortly to our council general and ask her to kindly give a word of thanks to our prime minister who came and talked uh, talk to us. And I'm inviting you all to come down with us. And you want to take the question before she says thank you? So you don't get to say thank you yet. She's going to take questions now. Thank you. I'll take a few questions. Um, I'm not sure if the, perhaps if your mic goes down there. We can take a few questions. Yes. I really want to thank all of you for coming out though this evening um, and the numbers really have touched my heart so thank you. Go ahead. Good evening Madam Prime Minister. Yes sir. Um, it's a pleasure to hear you this evening and, and I welcome you. Thank you. Um, my question is what are you going to do about um, those guys who go around shooting people, like people are going out of style. What are you going to do about that? Are you considering hanging some of these guys um, uh, to set to set an uh, example? Uh, to set an example, and uh, two, could you tell us what you are doing now to help combat that situation? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Obviously, we've had some difficulties in the last few um, years, and I say years, and it's largely as a result, I think, of the absence of programming and the absence of things to do for our young people, unattached young people. Um, we used to say the devil finds work for idle hands, but also unattached young people too. And it's a challenge which my government has taken on readily. There were a number of things that we discovered that led to, regrettably, a number of... And it's all relative. I mean, for us, it is bad. Compared to others in the region, it is still very much marginal with respect to gun crimes um, in, in, in the region. Having said that, the country had a situation where, for the better part of the last five, six years, the last government did not put the scanners into the port system to allow them to be able to scan what was coming in. Um, I think the Attorney General indicated in his evidence before Parliament six weeks ago that only 6% of the containers that were coming into the country have, were being scanned. Similarly, um, we had difficulties with the programming for young people being abandoned. If I can very quickly summarize what my government is doing, um, first and foremost, you solve a problem by making sure that we don't add to the numbers. And we've therefore determined that we have to have the kind of social programming and educational reform that is going to make a difference to people coming up, especially people between the ages of 8 and 15 years old, where they're most vulnerable to fall off of the track. Um, Parliament just agreed for us to put aside $5 million in dedicated training in youth and for young people in cultural and sporting activities and we've also agreed to spend money in each constituency in dealing with entrepreneurial activities on the blocks so that we can get people and give them purpose. When people have something to lose, even if it is reputation alone, but reputation, job, taking care of family, they think twice about getting into trouble. With respect to those who have already determined that that is the road that they want to walk, well, then you have to pay the price for your actions. And my government passed last week, and I'm happy that the Parliament of Barbados spoke with one voice, that we are not prepared for persons who are already on bail for murder 
or who are already on bail for firearm offenses to be coming back out and committing the same crimes after the police have done a wonderful job in taking them up from there. As a result, there were constitutional amendments passed last week where we will commit, and there's always a balance, we commit that we have to get these cases done quickly. Um, I announced the addition of three more criminal high courts to the two that we have existing so that there will be five criminal high courts operating very shortly. Similarly, that in addition to that, we are not going to agree that anyone should get bail for the first 24 months um, having been charged with murder, treason, or firearm offense because we believe that six to nine months for murder cases is more than enough time for the cases to be heard at first instance and then probably about another 12 months until it goes through the two other appellate stages. Um, we're not accustomed to a lot of murders in Barbados and for the most part our murder rate has been flat and that's why these gun crimes have been difficult. But we've seen over the last few decades an increase in the presence of guns and you see it across the world. New Zealand is a place that you would never, ever have thought that something like that would have happened in Christchurch, New Zealand a few weeks ago. And, and, and we see it across too many other parts of the world. Why? Because people have ready access to guns. People always used to fight. People always had fallouts. But before they would use a two by three, they would use a rock. They might even use a Collins. But they didn't have semi-automatic weapons. Let's talk the truth. And it is the prevalence of these weapons in easy access to people who perhaps have not yet learned how to reason and to think properly in the first 15 to 30 seconds of anger. Somebody disrespect me and up in arms. You have to bring people back down. And that's why I say that the ultimate solution is not just the law enforcement solution but it is also the concomitant policies that we are going to do to build a society and to make people stronger. I also want to make the point, and ironically, thank you, but ironically, the chap who was killed last week in LA, Nipsey Hussle, there's a brilliant piece by him that talks about how people behave in survival mode and that people lose sometimes sense of direction and rightness and wrongness because their brain can't function unless they deal with that. And that's why above all else, I'm saying to you that we have to balance economic security with compassion and caring and caring for one another. And, and that was the Beijing way all along, that everybody didn't always have, but had a share pot mentality. People used to share. Similarly, everybody understood that the objective was to be able to provide for yourself wherever you could in spite of that. And we have to find ways of creating what an opportunity for all Barbadians again in a way that the worst thing that happened in the last decade, worse than the reserves we inherited, worse than the debt we inherited, was the sense that it was okay for people to leave school and don't have a job for the first six, seven, eight years of their life having left school. Because if people don't get in, if young people don't get into the habit of having to go to work, wake up in the morning, bathe, dress, go to a job, whether you're going to a job straight from high school or whether you're going to a job from university, you have to go to something purposeful when the day comes. Whether it is as to be trained further as an apprentice, it doesn't matter. But what started to happen and what frightened me, and if you go back to the speeches I was making all through the last three, four years before the campaign, I kept saying that this country is going to pay a heavy price for the fact that people have gotten into the habit, I've never seen it before, where they left school and for four, five, six, seven years, they never knew what it was to go to work. And that is what we're trying to fight against. As to the hanging, we don't hang courts, do. 
and I'm being straight with you. But what we will do is to make sure that we try to create a safe Barbados and that the different arms of government do the jobs that they're supposed to do. Thank you. Just so you know, I'm going to take one from the left and one from the right. One from the left, one from the right. Good evening, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Donna Ford, and I am one of those nostalgic by descent citizens. I'm asking this question on behalf of my parents, Mrs. Isaline Wiltshire Ford and Mr. James Ford, who are um, with me this evening. Um, for those of us who are living outside of the country, and this falls back into what the Honorable Kirk um, uh, Humphrey was speaking to with regards to economics and business for those who are living outside of the country and have some sort of excitement or interest in investing in the in in Barbados um, What procedures do you have in place to ensure that matters can be dealt with in a timely and efficient manner? Um, when doing business in Barbados mm. You mean in terms of being able to invest up front? documents, uh, making sure that those documents mm -hmm. are um, uh, t tended to in an efficient and timely manner. Mm -hmm. We're now literally deconstructing and reconstructing almost every area of doing business in Barbados. Um, and largely because, once again, a lot of the practices, a lot of the rules, a lot of the things are mid-20th mid, mid century. I almost said 19th century. The police and the psychiatric hospital are 19th century. We have the third oldest police force in the Commonwealth, and we've got to bring it into the 21st century. We have a psychiatric hospital that was established in 1875 and a post office in 1850, and we've got to bring them jump, jump through the 20th century and come straight to the third decade of the 21st century, which starts next year. So what we've literally been doing, the minister, for example, of um, Minister Toppin gave a statement on the Corporate Affairs Registry on Tuesday, a ministerial statement, showing how we are literally deconstructing and reconstructing it. We are in the process of talking actually to a Canadian company who is likely to do a public-private partnership with us on the Corporate Affairs Registry in order to be able to make it seamless and within hours um, for you to do your business online and not have to come down there and form and go through and take forever to get companies registered or charges registered, which is what it has been for some time, regrettably. We're also trying to be able to um, create on the commercial platform. We're going to create a dedicated commercial court within the next two to three months. We voted the money and the estimates last, last month so that the applications for the advertisements for those posts for judges will go out very shortly. And as you know, it makes no sense creating an environment for people to do business if they can't get commercial decisions from a commercial court in quick order. We also created new town planning legislation very shortly um, after coming into office. In fact, it passed in January. The existing town planning legislation was 1965, the year I was born. We passed new planning and development legislation at the end of January, reversing 50-something years of, of a different practice. And we've introduced a new concept in it that hopefully will save significant amounts of time and especially for those of you who want to build at home but don't have the time to be back and forth, back and forth. Um, before you might make an application to town planning and people would just tell you no. Now we've said no, that's not good enough, that you must give, if you're going to refuse, it must be a provisional refusal, but you must also notify the applicant on what conditions will satisfy approval. So you get a provisional refusal, refusal and a conditional acceptance. Those things we passed in end of January, and that law comes into force on the 1st of June. So sector by sector by sector, we're doing the same thing with liquor licenses. We're doing the same thing with um, immigration, with driver's licenses. As I said in the budget a couple of weeks ago, that over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, you're going to see a whole range of services that hitherto were only accessible by you walking in and taking time and hoping somebody can help you through. A lot of these things are going to be available digitally now. We're also moving to have digital payments and to be able to remove the checks to NIS and to others by the end of September this year um, so that 
you can pay your taxes digitally. For a lot of you who may have land taxes at home to pay, that will help you significantly rather than you having to send only money to somebody. And if you have your foreign currency account, it will make it easier and easier for you to transfer the money. <laughs> so. Yeah, you want to follow up? Just a quick follow up on the town and country planning. For those documents that were um, perhaps in the office before January 1st, um, when do you, uh, per, 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 when would they, they be, um, let's say, sent back, or when would you get a response? Well, we're trying to see how we can put it on a platform now where the institutional structure can digitize as much as possible and to be able to get answers out to people. So there will be a backlog in terms of trying to get it done. For those that are now applying, obviously yours will be quicker because you're going to get immediately, um, if it's a no, you're going to get a yes, and then I think a conditional yes, and you have time to say 14 days to decide whether you're going to accept it, and if not, you shift it back to them, and they have 28 days. So we're trying to put some timelines that are far more reasonable. But you're right, for those that we've inherited, look, I'm now doing town planning applications and appeals that were there since, in some instances, eight years, seven years, six years ago. And I literally have files upon files coming to me every week trying to get rid of that backlog. So I imagine it will take at least a year, 18 months, at least, to get rid of that backlog. But what we're trying to do is to stop the flow for the backlogs getting worse and worse by having a fast track there. Similarly, I now have the minister in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment, Minister Cattle, uh, Marsha Cattle. She now meets every Monday afternoon with all of the town planning and other in infrastructure related ministries to go through major developments. So major projects in the country are literally fast track at a much quicker rate because we bring everybody into the room and everybody knows you've got to come with your say. The new legislation also creates a planning board which does the same thing before it gets to the minister. So for those projects that are not at the quantum or the scale for the minister, they'll have that same collegial and collaborative approach there. So we'll see. Not necessarily, just give me the application number. If you give me the application number, I'll make sure we check it out for you. Tiffany? You understand? If we give me the application number, we'll check it out for you. You understand? But we're literally trying to move that backlog. Okay. Thank you, my dear. Tiffany? Oh, uh, good evening, Prime Minister Motley. Um, I'm a nostalgic descendant um, from Montreal. And my question is, when you spoke about the third district in terms of this idea of NGOs and projects that can be developed, mm. one of the connections that I would hope to see happen with Bayesians in the diaspora or descendants like myself is the transfer of knowledge, innovation, or projects that we've developed here to respond to our Love socioeconomic it. difficulties or challenges we've had in Quebec and in Canada. So what would you suggest as the best steps in order for us to be able to transfer that information to Barbados or to build projects? Would it be through university connections or would we yeah. work directly with the ministries? Combination. Um, let me say, you know, how many people are here know Jimmy Cliff? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know that? If I, and Reggie was absolutely correct. If I could sing, I would not be standing here today. <laughs> because I would have gone into the music business with the rest. But because I couldn't sing, I had to manage a band, and then I learned they could talk. <laughs> but Jimmy Cliff had a song, you can get it if you really want, yeah, yeah. but you must try and try, you'll succeed at last. I intend to make sure that a project that we tried to start as far back as the late 1990s is successful this time. There has to be a register of Barbadians internationally with their skill set and their interests. There has to be a database that allows us to search and to work out. Oh, give me everybody who is in healthcare. Give me everybody who is in healthcare and nursing. Give me everybody who may be in healthcare and psych psych I'm psychiatric and psychological services. Mm -hmm. Give me everybody, anybody who is in the area of town planning and construction. Give me all civil engineers. If we don't do that, we are doing ourselves a disservice. And I don't only mean those of you whose navel string buried there, I mean those of you who are, as I said, citizens by descent. Okay? And citizens by descent by descent. Because the truth is, 
that the conversation which we have to have as a nation, and I know that the Minister of Home Affairs is bringing it, Edmund Hinkson, we put it in there. Ooh, I wrote that cabinet paper, that white paper, February 2006, and this is now 2019. The last government made some changes, regrettably, to it that were not positive, but never did anything besides that other than to lay it and never take any steps to change the law. But I feel strongly that if you are born in Barbados and your child can access citizenship by descent, that the next closest thing to your child is what? Your grandchild. And that the notion that a grandchild of a Bajan cannot access citizenship at a time when the country is underpopulated mm -hmm. is something that I have a difficulty with. And that we have to have the conversation as a nation, therefore. And, and in some instances, there's some tragic consequences. Because there may be people who may have come over here to study, young, marry, have a child while up here, they go back home, the child, for all intents and purposes, grows up in Barbados from three, four years old. <laughs> then the child does, like the parent, come back up here, study, get married again, have a child. Then they're too born up here, and they go back home. And then when they reach 12 and 13 and 14, realize, well, wait. The child taught with a Bajan accent, know everybody in the family is Bajan. But because they and their parents happen to be born here for the time period that the parents were out, they can be Bajans by Bajan citizens by the same. So we feel that we have to have the conversation with the country in order to be able to allow persons to have citizenship by descent to grandchildren. Because a grandchild is not an outside child. A grandchild is the most natural relationship in the nuclear family. And we feel, therefore, that citizenship should extend to that. Um, so we speak, therefore, not only to those of you born in Barbados or first generation, but second and third generation Barbadians. You have skills. Canada has invested a lot in you. You have invested a lot in yourself. And the same way that we can recognize dual citizenship, I'm sure Canadians wouldn't mind you, the Canadian government wouldn't mind you sharing some of your skills back with Barbados to help us build out our country. And certainly the opportunities for investment are there. On the investment point, I'll say this too. We are going to establish unit trust corporations and we are also establishing a growth and innovation fund on the stock exchange to be able to help other companies at home build out, whether in renewable energy, whether in, um, in the productive sectors, hotels, whatever. And we're doing it because if you take your money now and you put it in the bank, you are going to get 0.1% in savings, 0.05%. And while you may not be prepared to risk all of your savings, you may decide that, look, I'm going to risk a third of my savings to get a higher rate of return because 0.1, I really pay in the bank to keep my money. The bank can pay me. <laughs> Think about it. And the one shortage is, is that when you heard Kirk talk about closing the circle of enfranchisement, it is because we have not come to public life for our citizens to become tenants in their own country. We have come to public life because these fields and hills beyond recall are now our very own. And we have to create the opportunities, therefore, for our citizens to own. It's not just physical property, but it's also shares and opportunities within other productive enterprises. Yes? Thank you, Thank and you. I'm sold, so I'll, I'll help. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to seeing you in Barbados even before the gathering then. <laughs> Christchurch month, October 2020. That's a long time come before. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, Prime Minister. Thank you. I am from St. Bernard's Village, St. Joseph. Ah. All right. <clears throat> there you go. I have two questions. One on behalf of my son uh, who visits Barbados very often. He mm -hmm. was born here. He's very concerned about the service industry and how rude people are becoming in Barbados. That's the first one. Rude. The second one, um, 
we've been going through a problem with real estate and a lawyer or lawyers for the longest time where they wait wait the lawyers believe that we have so much money in Canada they charge us for everything and you wouldn't believe the process has been going on for so many years my lawyers just charged me for uh, pencils and you know you get a bill for unbelievable things nonsense um, so I would like to know what is being done about that so okay. that's my two questions the truth is that um, on the first one with respect to the service industry I said earlier that if you don't maintain a house what happens you don't maintain a body what happens and look Barbados for the last decade and I'm not saying it I think you know it too and I'm not just idle talk we did not pay attention to the things that matter we didn't train the people in the proper way. We didn't spend the money on the things that we needed to be spending on. Our debt went from $6 billion to $15 billion in 10 years, and we have nothing to show for it. Okay? And, and that is why, in addition to the program that I've rolled out, I'm working with the social partnership because we must have what we call the re re program, where we are literally going to retrain people and we're going to empower and enfranchise people and and I've said it that we're going to take every single task in the island from washing cars right back up to lawyers and doctors and accountants and we're going to define what is excellence in each job in the case of the car don't bring a chamois that got grit in it to scratch up the car in the case of the lawyer You've got service standards and you have also clear scale of fees that have to be applied. Maybe it is time for us to also relook the scale of fees that we have hitherto because it does not relate to a modern Barbados and I've had that discussion with the Attorney General. And we also have to digitize a lot of what we are doing with respect to our land registry because like with other countries in the world, Barbados is too small. I could take that phone and look now at the whole island with Google Earth and just keep pushing my hand on the finger, <laughs> finger on the screen and map over the whole island in no time at all. Not true? And if you do so, I'll open it up with the iPhone with the two fingers so you can open up and open up to the smallest possible lot on, on the thing. Now you can't have all of that technology available to you and you not therefore move to be able to make the transfer of land as simple as the filling out of applications. Okay, and, and the notion that people hold on to professions that hitherto were lucrative for the sake of holding on to them cannot be the basis of a modern competitive Barbados. And to that extent, therefore, the same company that we're talking to out of Canada here for the corporate registry and the vital statistics registry that we're forming, we're talking to them also about the land registry. One of the last things I did before the end of the financial year and it can only happen at certain times of the year, was to be able to commission the aerial photography of Barbados so that we can do the cadastral survey and that we can also start to move the platform for us to be able to digitize how we treat to our land and our land registry in a more effective way. But the truth is that there is so much to be done. That, that's why I'm up here asking everybody to be able to become active citizens and our responsibility, and that's where it needs to come to us, not just in a conversation as I walk out this building, because then you're depending on my memory. <laughs> then you're depending on me not getting a cold or a headache. That can't work. That we have a simple system, and I hope that, um, I know Reggie was doing a little, you're doing the thing still? A little draw, and I'm hoping that that's the first step to being able to leave your name and phone number and email. But separate from that, that there has to be a project launched on a website where you can go and put down your information, it's confidential, and we take it in a way that is searchable and that allows us really to be able to utilize skills in a positive way. My government also has been very clear about procurement rules and transparency. 
and even for unsolicited bids, if we get unsolicited proposals that are of substantive nature over a certain threshold, we say no, put it out there and give other people an opportunity to be able to also bid because the best way I know is for us to be fair and transparent. That is the truth. Okay? Thank you. On the lawyers, I think I kind of answered you that they too have to be subject to the discipline of retraining and also new rules. In fact, there was a report done when I was Attorney General that we brought back up that was done by Professor Patchett, who was Dean of the Law Faculty, and Sir Roy Marshall that has to look at a reform of the legal profession act because there are just too many stories, um, not just from you in Canada, but throughout the diaspora of lawyers not being responsive. And sometimes it may not even be that they're doing anything bad, but they're just not responsive to people. And you can't be not responsive to people in a service sector where you are a fiduciary agent for people's money. Antonia? Yes, ma'am. I'm Antonia who will be flawed for saying that I am a feminist. And I'm very happy that you have injected gender into all of your policies. Now that Barbados is reaching a stage where women will vote for women and whatever, and for a just and healthy planet, as we say from We Do, I Belong to that uh, movement, I would like to ask you if you don't think that the exchange should come from the south there in Barbados here rather than for us to fool you that we can all do all these things that we're doing because our voices are not it is not just about the right the um, the sea tides and whatnot we need to raise our voices we had people here from the government of Quebec and Canada here today and they do very little for us because we don't ask them yeah. So if we are talking, as a taxpayer, and I'm talking about help for Barbados, all three levels of my government have to be yeah. in, um, involved. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that point, because the truth is that you have to be active citizens wherever you are. And that means here in Canada, as well as in Barbados. And, and our voices become, you know, what gets the oil? Okay, I ain't gonna say no more. <laughs> you understand? If, and, and that's part of the problem that Caribbean citizens have had, not just in North America, but in the UK and elsewhere as well. That we get taken for granted largely because we have not become vocal in our citizenship and in our advocacy for key issues that are affecting our communities, our communities here and our communities back home. And I pray that more and more we'll see ourselves first and foremost as global citizens with Bajan roots or global citizens with Bajan roots and a Canadian residence. You can choose whatever combination and permutation you want. Or global citizens with Canadian and Bajan citizenship papers. But the bottom line is because the world in which we live in has become so precarious in its existence both in terms of climate change physical environment, as well as in terms of the stability and the terrorism and the different other things. We have a duty to play our part. And Bajans have a strong experience and a strong voice. Look, there's not everything that we are going to agree on as nation states, but that doesn't stop us from being friends even if we disagree on one or two matters. And similarly, as citizens in a nation, there's not everything you're going to agree with me as Prime Minister Barbados on. But I can't get vexed with you if I disagree with you on one or you disagree with me on one thing. Because that's life. And we have therefore to inculcate in our people that power to speak truth. That, that, that courage to speak truth to power. You know, Shirley Chisholm is one of those proud Barbadians who we need to forever celebrate. And for those of you who don't know, she was the first African-American woman to serve in Congress in the United States of America. But she was also the first black woman to run in a serious way for the presidential election in 1972. And you have YouTube now and you can go back and listen to her. And listen to the power in her voice and the 
determination to speak truth to power. And where did it come from? Where does she keep reminding people that it came from? From her grandmother raising her in Vauxhall Christ Church. You understand what I'm telling you? From her grandmother raising her in Vauxhall Christ Church. And I therefore hope that more and more of our people will understand the power of their voice, particularly collectively. I have said, and I'm going to say it from where I stand as Prime Minister, as I've said it from before I became Prime Minister, that the power of the people is always greater than the people in power. We need to use it. And I would like to mention that we had the representative from the cabinet of the government of, of Quebec here today, and he was dealing with English-speaking Quebecers. Mm -hmm. He is the parliamentary secretary to the premier. Okay. It's unfortunate that he's not there anymore, mm -hmm. but since you are a voice of authority that people will listen to more than I can did, <laughs> I'm glad that you injected what you did to support what I was saying. I, I, I want you to believe that people will listen to your voices too. And it is the power of your voices that's going to make that fundamental difference. So and, and similarly with the movement. That, so that they will stop saying that that ministry for Anglophones is only for the mainstream. We don't outreach to, to the government and then we blame them. I, I don't Thank know you. enough of the issue, nor can I get involved. But what I will tell you is that you all have a voice and you have to use it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Jean? Good evening, Madam Prime Minister. Good evening, ma'am. Before I preface my question, I'd like to say kudos. There is a woman in power! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> It is not by accident that I am following Antonio, but I was afraid that Antonio would ask my question. Mm. Speaking as a woman mm. and having a woman in power, mm. I would like to know if the attitude of men in Barbados towards women in Barbados in the line of abuse, sexual harassment, women abuse and the like is going to be addressed by this current mm. government. Mm. I, as a person, as a woman, when I go to Barbados, I have to walk with company on the street. Mm -hmm. Even though I am 73 years old, which I'm not ashamed to say. <laughs> and I also want to tell you, Madam Prime Minister, that I am one of the few women activists who has worked for the last 30 years for a union in Montreal. So, when I go to Barbados, I do not walk alone, simply because I am intimidated, afraid, and frustrated, because there's always somebody, some man, if you speak to him, he would want to say, <laughs> you know what goes on. On the other hand, I am, I am tired, I think it is time, that the issue of female abuse mm -hmm. was addressed. Mm -hmm. It is not acceptable that men are still beating their women or husbands beating their wives or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. So that is one part of my question. Let, let me say to you, look, building a nation. Just a second, Prime Minister. Could you please tone it down a bit so that everyone can hear? Thank you. Sorry, Prime Minister. But, Building a nation is like raising a people. And raising a people is like raising many children. And it's a process. And we're going to fool ourselves if we believe that we can deal with issues of violence and self-hatred. Because that's a lot of what it is that we're talking about overnight. But what we have to do is to have the mature conversations and start to train our people um, equally and, but we also have to admit of a level of
patience in understanding the issue and in dealing with it. I am satisfied that the issue of violence is not only in relationships, it's not just relationships, violence, um, it's not men against women, women against men alone, it is also violence in the society, sometimes violence in the way in which we speak with each other um, and to each other. Um, and all of these things require training and public education and sensitization again. So that when we talk about retraining in all of the senses, we talk about it because we believe that that retraining is pivotal to the kind of society that we want to have. I will just end on this one point because some of these things are best determined within the context within which we're doing and speaking it rather than generalizations because generalizations just cause people to take more entrenched positions. But in all the years that I had difficulties and people coming at me, I learned to say one thing, leave the ball outside the off stump. You don't, you don't have to keep playing every time somebody attacks you. And, and, and the Bible says it better, turn the other cheek sometimes. <laughs> Nelson Mandela said it, Jesus Christ said it, and the bottom line is, if you ask me who are the people that I admire the most, it is Jesus Christ and Nelson Mandela. Because I believe that if we are going to make a change in terms of how people perpetuate either abuse or violence, then we have to start by changing how we ourselves treat the other people. But, yes, I have another question. I have another question. On the, subject of, on the subject of immigration, I understand that Barbadians are very unhappy at the idea of immigrants coming into the country. My question is, what plans are being put in place to gradually integrate foreigners into the country? We know, having lived, having lived overseas for, all, for over 50 years, we understand that a country needs to be built by immigration. However, immigration usually, immigration, we have lived immigration by us going to another country. We have not been used to a lot of immigrants moving to Barbados to help build the country. I think, I think Barbadians help. understood after the last government issued the unfortunate remarks of ever so welcome wait for a call, that when that happened, all of a sudden a lot of people left the country. So people weren't able to rent apartments and houses anymore. Shops were not getting the same volume of business. Public transport was not getting the same level of support. And that was a rude awakening for a lot of Barbadians that became wrapped up in the economic decline that the country was facing. I don't feel the venom against immigration in the same way that people say. In fact, the reason why Barbados has the highest repeat visitor rate of all Caribbean countries for tourists is because the average Barbadian is the most hospitable person to persons visiting the country. Okay. okay. We, are, we are coming up to the end and time is of the essence. So what I'm going to do, I'm not, who's here will get your questions, but we won't take any more. But I'm thinking we might start packaging. So you've got two over there who want to speak, Nigel? Three? Three. Maybe if we could get two people. Prime Minister, do you have something to take the note or no, is someone I have, to take I have the a good note? Memory. Sorry, you have a good memory? Okay. So two of you ask your question. No follow up. Sorry. And uh, then we'll do two from here. We'll get it done. So two go now, please. Yes, um, Madam Prime Minister, I know you are a very strong supporter of CARICOM, movements of people to the Caribbean. I also is a strong supporter of that because, as you said, there's a shortage of people in Barrios as family is not increasing. But there's a big pushback from the Barbadian population of the movement of people to the Caribbean. I believe that Barbados and the Caribbean will, be only, will only survive under the CARICOM and the movement of people and goods effort need to survive in this global world. Okay. So what is your take on that? One more, please. The next person, please ask your question. Welcome, Your Honorable 
Prime Minister, Madam Mayor Motley. Congratulations and success to all challenges in the administration of the government of Barbados. My name is Horace Drakes. Some years ago, your present Attorney General, Dale Marshall, came here into Montreal on a similar mission when your Barbados Labour Party was in power. I personally invest lots of Canadian uh, currency in Barbados. It took me three attorneys, 13 years, and over 26 trips to achieve a favorable judgment. It further took death of the defendant to occur to regain possession of my building. Question, please advise the public how your administration can illuminate these hurdles to encourage and protect investors. I have also consistently insured the said property with Ultimate Insurance Broker Limited and Trident for the entire years to exist the securing of my investment after repossession. However, the insurance company, after having the decision of regaining the property, said the claim was not um, acceptable. I leave this question with you, and I pass on the documentation and the supporting documents for you to investigate this insurance company to make sure that their documentations are correct and that they have followed the procedures after such a long time and at the initial stages, ensuring the security of insurance in case that the building was damaged and all the other defectors did occur, as we do here in Canada. And after succeeding, the insurance company said they would not honor a right. policy that I paid for 13 years before default. Okay. Thank you Couple very much. Thank things. you very much. On the last point, I obviously can't comment because I don't have enough facts, but my Director of Finance and Economic Affairs is here. If you give him, because I don't believe that this is a political issue, it's a regulatory issue. Um, the Financial Services Commission is established in order to oversee the conduct of insurance companies. Um, and as to whether it is a regulatory failure, a systemic failure of the company, um, or a factual failure or something that may be contributory negligent on your part, I can't say. But suffice it to say that if you speak to the Director of Finance after this meeting, we can trigger a process to understand it. As it relates to your first comment and the length of time that it took you to get a result, one of the reasons why we are the government of Barbados now is because we, like you, complained about the failure and the implosion of many institutions. In our view, too many of our institutions became the subject of internal implosion and the law courts, regrettably, and the system of law was one of them. So the bad news is, is that what is happening is wrong um, for us. We are not happy. In fact, I am ashamed that that is the refrain from so many of you as I move around the diaspora. But I also say to you that it is also the refrain of thousands of Barbadians who, when they file claims, have said that they cannot get in and out of court in under four, five, six, seven years. And that is why on Tuesday this week and on Wednesday, the government also, in addition to the reconstruction that we are going to do for how we file and to put things on an electronic platform, we also amended the Constitution to be able to require um, of judges uh, compliance with times for timely decision of judgments. And we did it in the inverse in saying that it is now one of the reasons which can be a cause for the removal of a judge if the judgments have not been delivered within six months of the hearing of the cases. Now, I don't believe that judges are the sole reason for delay in the justice system. I believe that it's a combination of factors ranging from every single player. But the cumulative impact 
has been disastrous to the country's reputation and disastrous to the rule of law being administered in the country, both civilly and criminally. And that's why with, within less than a year, we have moved so quickly, one, to expand the number of judges, to create three more criminal courts, as I told you, high courts, two, to create a dedicated commercial court that will allow both Barbadians and international business players to have access to it. Three, to do the private-public partnership on the registries, the corporate registry, the land registry, and the vital statistics registry. Four, that we've invested now in software in order to be able to allow for electronic filing. And the truth is the Attorney General has done a wonderful job in being able to bring about these reforms in under 10 months. And they're going to continue to roll out the different reforms because with the best will in the world, they still only got 24 hours in a day. So, but the bottom line is, is that we know there has been a problem. The problem has not been to Barbadians overseas alone. It's been to everyone. And we have determined as a government that this is an area of our society and economy that needs rehabilitation, um, restructuring as a matter of urgency largely because you cannot have a stable society if you do not have due process and rule of law applying in the society. So I thank you for sharing with us, and I encourage you to speak to the DFE when we finish. As to the first comment on CARICOM, um, I really want to say that, and I answered it earlier with the lady, that truthfully, the experience of that mass exodus from Barbados that took that purchasing power away from the economy, I think caused people to think twice again about the negative and unfortunate comments that were made eight, nine, ten years ago with respect to immigration. And the bottom line is we cannot survive on our own. No man is an island. No island can survive on its own. And we have seen what it is to benefit from people moving in and out with respect to immigration to help us build key parts of our economy in the past. I am saying to you now from where I stand as Minister of Finance that I need more people coming to work to build out the economy. Not necessarily living in Barbados, but wherever you are in the world, building out to build, working to build out the Barbadian economy and investments in whatever way you can. And CSME is one of the most perfect ways of doing it. I agree with you. But I think that the xenophobia that you're referring to is not as sharp and not as present as people would like to believe. It's more a notional thing than a reality. And it's ugly. And it is ugly. It's very, very but I think ugly. that we learned the hard way. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to put you two together and then you two for that. So please. Prime Minister Motley, thank you for coming to being here with us. My question to you is, from the time I have confidence in you and your party, thank you. and like you said, you have a lot of work to be done and you need our help. Thank you. What I wanted to do for you was, I wanted to set up a GoFundMe Barbados for all the friends of Barbados. And I figured with a small, if we got that started, but I didn't know where and how to get it started. He doesn't only lame, he does a lot of good work. And that's the thing that I thought, <laughs> that if all of us Barbadians, because not everyone has yeah. a lot of money to invest, yeah. but if we could put $5 together yep. and $10, it will grow and can become of help and, and there are to Barbados. And there are groups at home who need and will wonderfully accept the support and institutions that wonderfully will accept from, from schools to the geriatric hospital to the hospital itself. Um, to some community groups, children's homes. So I'd like to encourage, as I said, once we get the database going, and those of you who have wonderful ideas, that's why Reggie's here, that's why Sonia's here, that's why your honorary consul is here, and that's why we have the technology now to make it work for us. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, the Honorable um, Prime Minister of Barbados. My name is Fabian Trotman. Um, I'm a Bajan by descent. Um, my question today is um, the following. Um, tourism is a, a major uh, economic uh, part of Barbados' economy. And um, my question is, um, 
regards to like hotels, um, whatever makes up the, the tourism uh, eco uh, component of the, of, the, of the economy, are you going to hold these people who are running these companies, the hotels, the, the big hotels, responsible for the um, pr processing, like developing hospitals, schools, like, because basically my, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I feel like a lot of industries come into Barbados and they take the, the resources, but don't put equally mouths back into the system to, to, to help the people. We're trying to build a fair country. Yeah. One of the things that we're going to be doing with the new planning and development legislation that I referred to earlier is doing a lot more things called like planning gains. So where you have major developments coming, we say to them, okay, in addition to us giving you permission for this, we want you to enter into contract with us where you will agree to do X, Y, Z. So if there's flood mitigation that's needed, if there is a community center that's needed, if there is low income housing in some instances is giving people from different particular communities opportunities because if they're going to have to bear with the dust and the noise of the construction, then maybe 40% of the jobs ought to go to that community. There are different things. So yes, in short order. Okay. Thank you. Thank Can you, you handle three? Can you I remember can. three? I can. Okay. Because Sparrow oh. said ten to one is murder, but not three. All right, all right. <laughs> so we're going to go three to wrap this up. Okay. So I'm going to let you go, and you put those two together, and then we're, we're done. There Thank you, go. you. Good afternoon, Madam Prime Good Minister. Evening. Such a pleasure to meet you. Good to meet you. Too. I just want to say that we are family. Really? You might not believe it, but as a young child growing up in Barbados. I remember my grandmother pretty often going down at five o'clock in the morning to go and see Mr. Motley. <laughs> Mr. Motley, I considered him to be my father because he always made sure I had food to eat, I had a uniform, I had material to make my school uniform. I was ne my grandmother was never too proud. Since you are coming from that family, I know that you have 100% our needs at heart. That's why I'm here to give you my 100% support. Thank you, my dear. I am so happy that you made it, and I will support you to the best of my ability. Thank you. Madam Prime Minister, I also want to ask you, what are the plans for the disabled people in Barbados. The reason for my question, the reason for my question is this. My mom is disabled. She is no longer able to walk and, for her, and she is quite obese. And for her to be able to see the island of Barbados again is almost an impossibility. She's dying to go, I'm willing to take her but once the plane lands in Barbados, she will not be able, or it will be very difficult for her to get off of the plane. Is there something that is in plan for these type of people will be able to disbark the airplane in a satisfactory manner? I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, let can me- Can we put these two together yeah, for you? I can just do this very quickly for okay. this reason because of the poignancy of the moment. I want to thank you for your very generous comments and simply to say to those who are hearing me or those who are present, particularly the younger ones, my grandfather died in 1973 and I don't think a week goes by without somebody coming and telling me thank you for things that he did 40 something years after he died. But what it says to me is truly that it is the living embodiment, that what matters more than anything else is not wealth or any of that, but is how you live your life and the impact that you make on people. Okay? <laughs> Secondly, um, with respect to the differently able, we are trying, and, and that's part of the difficulty that I said that hurts us with respect to having limited fiscal space. But even with that, if you come now, you will see that at the airport, we use not the steps anymore, but we use the ramps where wheelchairs can be literally um, rolled out. 
we are about by the, in fact, later this week in Washington, D.C., I meet with the IFC again because Cabinet has agreed to do a concession on Grantley Adams International Airport that will see a major expansion there. So you'll see a lot more there at the airport, but across the country, what we've said as a government is that we have to become a good society. And in being a good society, by making government buildings accessible, sidewalks accessible, public spaces accessible, that we are also creating economic activity and capital works that Absolutely. keep other people working. So let us prioritize the things that make us a good society first. And making the society comfortable for the differently able is one of those things that will make us a good society. Thank okay. you. The last two questions, please. Yes. Could you okay, put them together and that's it? <laughs> I need you as a moderator home. You ready to yeah. come home? <laughs> <laughs> I do this for the federal government. They love me. They say, oh, we got to be on time because she's not going to mess around. <laughs> okay, Thank Madam you. Prime Minister, I would like to know, you spoke about banking, um, the exchange of currency. Mm -hmm. Now, nearly everyone in this room probably must have some kind of an altercation with the banks with currency from here it goes down very easy but to get it back you can't mm -hmm. now if we would invest in barbados um is it a one-way passage for our money or no. in other words it has no. two ways that, that, you finish and answer both questions together but no this gentleman is smiling because he formerly of central bank to dr greenwich <laughs> who is um one of the specialists that i've taken back from the imf for the three four years to help us yeah. but he bitching at you and me yeah <laughs> okay okay go. um good evening madam prime minister um it's a pleasure to meet you in person. My question is about the healthcare system in Barbados. I've been hearing um, so many negative things about the healthcare system, the long wigs, the condition, the treatments. Are there any plans that you have to improve that? Second question is, um, I've been seeing on social media all the time about the school children there fighting and killing each other and everything. What are you going to do about that? All right. Let me deal Thank let me you. deal with the last first. The notion we really don't have the school children killing each other. And we have had some fights, but the truth is that this thing called social media popularizes things that happened before that just people never saw before. And that's part and part parcel of the difficulty Social media is both a tool, but it is also something that can make seem worse that which was happening all the years, okay? Um, and in fact, when I was at school, regrettably, there were people, and there was a girl killed at foundation school. There were, there were incidents, but because of the power of social media and the immediacy of it, you, you, you feel it in a different way. Um, as it relates to healthcare, we are about to open up two more polyclinics for 24 hour um, openings. Winston Scott Polyclinic, which is in town, near the hospital, and the David Thompson Polyclinic in St. John, which will service the people of St. Philip, St. John, St. Joseph, St. Andrew, St. George, as well. People are predominantly in the east of the country, and we're doing that in order to take some of the pressure off of the accident and emergency at the QEH. In addition, my government in the budget last year, I committed one of the things that I committed to when I told Madam Lagarde that we need a little breakfast before the long journey. We committed also to make $10 million available in order to be able to fully rehabilitate and expand the accident and emergency department which regrettably, in my view, was totally unacceptable for, for treatment of people, particularly not just the people who are sick, but the families who have to wait on the people who are sick because it's just too small, too thing up, and, and just not acceptable. And you spend money on the things that you prioritize. My government prioritizes healthcare and will continue to prioritize healthcare because at the end of the day, People should not have to suffer simply because they don't have enough money to pay in order to deal with pain. Pain is immediate and it comes to everybody and equally. 
accidents, strokes, and heart attacks. Don't know anything about time. So don't care who you are. You understand? So that the conditions of the hospital have to be brought up in order to be able to cater to people properly. So the short answer is that my government has put money in place in order to be able to improve some of those things. We have a shortage of nurses. We genuinely have a shortage of nurses. And if we can get more young people into nursing and training them, it will help ease some of the problem. Um, and I've made the point that nursing is a profession that will not be replaced in the next few decades by robots. So we can confidently continue to expand the number of persons that we train in nursing. And we are looking now at doing that with the people who have established Ross University, which is a medical school, as you know, with 1,500 students and 100 faculty that opened in January of this year. They called me a, m a week after we won the government and said, look, are you interested in being one of the three countries that we're looking at for relocation? And we said, yes, of course. And within six months, they set up. There are 1,500 medical students. In fact, yesterday evening, when we were waiting on the arrangements for the plane, we didn't we want to get something to eat, and we went to Coverley and saw all of them milling around there and all of the economic activity that's happened there as a result. But their sister institution is a college called Chamberlain College that is interested in working with the Barbados Community College and UWE and whoever else in the expansion of training for nurses, etc. And that is a genuine issue. We have wonderful medical personnel in Barbados, but we have to bring our justice system and our healthcare system and our educational system back into the full 21st century. You can't ignore these institutions for a decade and expect them to be functioning as they were if you were treating them with care and attention and making investments every year. And that's the catch up that we're trying to do. As to my friend, where are you? With the one way question? <laughs> my budget just ensured that it's two way. Not only, not only will you not only will you be allowed to open up foreign exchange, foreign currency accounts in Barbados as a Barbadian, but we've also agreed that if you have a property that you would have and somebody is going to bring foreign currency and buy the property in foreign currency, that we will allow you to take back out the foreign currency without applying the capital appreciation formula that used to exist, largely because when you take back out the 10 million or the 5 million or the 500,000 or the 100,000 US or Canadian that you're selling the property for, there is no negative loss of foreign currency to the country because the person is bringing in the foreign currency. If you, however, are selling to a Barbadian, then you have to work out that there has to be a gradual approach to bringing it back out. But the bottom line is that since you can keep foreign currency in Barbados, you ain't got to worry your head about that no more. You can just keep the money both in local and foreign currency and keep accounts there. So the, I, I, I want to make this last point to you. Your question reinforced that I was correct with my officials. The worst thing you can do to people is put up fences. Exactly. When you put up fences, people then start thinking about what they got to do behind the fence yeah, or to get around the fence or over the fence or under the fence. But if people believe that they can move things openly and freely, then they will bring it in and they won't panic. And I am sure that many of you want to believe that in the same way that you have accounts here, that if you were to put a little something in Barbados, a portion of what you have there for you and your family or for when you come down there, and that you can move it out when you want to, that you are going to do it in helping to build your country. Because what you're doing is bolstering our reserves, bolstering the confidence in the country, and wanting to be able to ultimately invest. Because once you have a lot of cash sitting down in an account, and you realize that the account only earning 0.1% or less than 1%, you say, why don't buy a piece of land? Because what our grandparents tell us, land don't spoil. Land don't spoil. Land don't spoil. I like? Land don't spoil. So that, that really is the first step towards rebuilding your confidence and your relationship with the country. And that's what we're trying to do at an appropriate time. We don't need to issue debt again because we're trying to bring our debt down to 60%.
not the 125 that it is now or the 174 percent that we inherited that in the beginning we want to bring it down as much as possible but if in the future we do need to issue bonds we may be able to issue some foreign currency bonds as well in the market we can't discriminate and say only Bajans but there may be Canadians who may want to invest in Barbadian bonds again in the future, at some point in the future, but they must know that they can do so in a country where people can move in and out and get the proper returns exactly. when they're ready they want the in the currency in which they want. I want to thank everybody. Not um, yet, Prime Minister. Why? Because I got something else for you. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Mr. Gus Hollowworth, who is the secretary of Barbados House, has asked to give you uh, a little thing that they've got for you. Oh, thank you very much. I couldn't very well say no. On behalf of the Exec Council of Barbados House and all the members of Barbados House, we deeply appreciate you coming to coming to our home and, and sharing some some thoughts, some sharing some thoughts with us. And we want to present you with a book. It's called Marial Then and Now. And as you go through it, you will see some reflections of yesterday that look similar to Barbados. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Madam you. President. I want to thank everyone and to say to you that there's another reason that I came to Montreal too. McGill University has had a special relationship with Barbados for decades. Years. And I've come with Kurt because I want us to rebuild that relationship and to move it on an even stronger trajectory. Because last year was the year of the coral reef. Most people don't know the excellent work that has been done in research in Barbados for decades on our marine life and our coral reefs. And I want to be able to deepen that relationship with McGill University and Bel Air's Institute even more. So I've come to see you and I've come to see them. And I trust and pray that this is an active relationship that we can nurture and carry it from strength to strength. God bless you all and thank you for coming out this evening. Thank you. Prime Minister, the Council General. <laughs> yes. yes, you can keep that applause going because we want to thank the Prime Minister so very much for addressing us this evening. Thank you, Prime Minister. Keep going, please. And I would also like to thank Minister Kirk Humphrey, please. The other members of the head table, the High Commissioner Reginald Farley. And of course, our MC, Honorary Consul, Dr. Myrna Lashley. The presidents and uh, members of the Barbados House Montreal. The members of the delegation who would have traveled from Barbados with the Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Greenwich and Mr. Carrington. Specially invited guests, we have all of the members uh, from, the, from the government 